double checking, making sure it's recording the audio correctly. Sometimes I forget to do it, and it will be recording like low voice, so people will be watching like a silent movie. <laughs> <laughs> you changed your method because I was looking at one of your lectures from 2010, and the audio was almost unlistenable. Um, I changed the uh, the recorder. Um, back then, I was using um, a Bluetooth headset Got for that it. purpose, and Bluetooth headsets are not particularly good for you know sound quality. Right. Um, these are really good, you yeah. know, for sound quality. Yeah. These are, um, they, they're not exactly studio quality, <laughs> but they are good for, like, you know, band practice and stuff like that. They're, wow. they're really good for musical instruments. Wow. Um, so for lecture purposes, it's more than sufficient. Yeah. Um, and then I'll also make a folder for today. You know, if I don't remember to upload a folder, it's all going to be in the video anyway. And the programs that we'll be doing today are not going to be that complicated. Um, if anything that is worth your time to uh, basically look into again, it's going to be um, how to use GDB, how to use uh, the GNU debugger to debug your programs. Okay, so that's one thing that we'll definitely go over that is actually quite important. All right, so we'll switch back to um, the browser. And it has this. I'm assuming that everybody has a Linux environment up and running at this time. It doesn't have to be my distribution, doesn't have to be you know, Debian based, you just need some kind of Linux environment running so that you can do the homework assignments. The CGYN work? Hmm? CGYN, CGY win work. Sigwin? Yeah. It may work for some assignments, it may not work for others, because Sigwin is nothing more than an emulator of Unix type you know, system calls on top of Windows. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I kind of worry about you know the signal stuff, it may not work well when we're dealing when we're dealing with signals. So I would kind of stick with the virtual machine or have a native install of Linux just to be sure. All right, so let's go to this class and I'll talk about the first homework assignment. You know, some of you will find this kind of boring because you have turned in the homework assignment already. Two people have turned it in and I know more than two have actually got it done, just you know, have not turned it in at this point. All right, so to get started with this homework assignment, the background is you have to read the man pages of read and write. Those two are function calls. They are function calls in C, and because there are multiple pages for different read and write topics in, in the MAN system, you have to specify the chapter, which in the Debian system is chapter two. So if, when you go to a command line like this one, you just say MAN to read, to read uh, the topic called read in chapter two. So it will show you something like this. Um, is, this is not particularly long, you know, it only takes like five you know, page downs to get to the end. So I would just kind of read the whole thing. Um, and, you know, if you don't understand a particular concept, you know, you can, we can talk about it. You can just ask questions about it. But I'll go ahead and just read this one, you know, and so that we know how to interpret man pages like this one. Uh, the first part is just the name, you know, it's pretty obvious. Synopsis tells you how to use it inside the program in this case. So the first thing you want to do is to pound include unistd.h, which I think stands for Unix standard.h. And this is the prototype of the C function. In other words, it tells you what is the type that it returns and what are the types of the parameters to the function. The return type is size-t, which for the most part you can see it as an integer. Um, the first parameter is an integer. It is a file descriptor. We talked about file descriptor already when we talked about file uh, open and close. But for your homework assignment, you don't even need to open or close. Why? Because you're not opening a file. It's already open. It's already, it's open. already open. Yeah. Very good. Every program that you write in a Linux or Unix environment automatically has standard in, standard out, and standard er open. Okay. Even GUI programs. You know, GUI programs have exactly the same three streams already open before your program gets control in main. The second one is um, a void pointer to buff, which what, what that means is buff, B-U-F, 
is a pointer to lo some location in memory. Void, or this part of it, you know, a void pointer, simply means you know we don't care exactly what is the type that buff is pointing to. It's just you know some location in memory. Um, the last one is size. Size t is the type. It is a count which for the most part is just an integer. You're telling um, the function read to go to this file descriptor, read this many bytes into the location pointed to by buff. That's the interpretation of the read function. And if you read the next part description, it's exactly doing, they're saying the same thing. Read attempts to read up to count bytes. If it is underlined, it is not just an English word. If it is underlined, it is referring to a parameter specified in the um, prototype. From the file descriptor FD into the buffer starting at buff. Well, I just said that earlier. Now this part is also important. If count is zero, read returns zero and has no other effect or has no other result. If count is greater than size max, the result is unspecified. In other words, the range you know, of count has to be limited. But in your homework assignment, that should not be an issue because you only have to read one byte at a time. On success, the number of bytes read is returned. Zero indicates end of file, and the file position is advanced by this number. In other words, if you want to read 10 bytes, if you tell read to read 10 bytes, but there are only five bytes available at that time, it will return a value of five. In other words, it will tell you, well, I know you asked me to read 10 bytes, but I can only find five bytes to read at this point. It is not an error if this number is smaller than the number of bytes requested. This may happen, blah, 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 so it, you know, just exactly what I said earlier. Um, or because read has, was interrupted by a signal. On error, negative one is returned. So technically speaking, your program should check for negative one too, just in case there's an error of some kind. But it doesn't have to have it, you know, because my test script is not going to create an erroneous condition and test for that. We will we'll <coughs> talk about error none, you know, and all the other ways to report an error later on in this class. But for this homework assignment, do not worry about you know, these cases. Um, the errors, these are macros that are defined in another file. They're basically saying you know, each one is a specific value to mean a particular way that you know, read can fail. Yep. If, okay, why would, it, why would we actually get an, a negative one if we're reading from standard? Uh, or if we're reading from standard, and like what condition would cause that? Well, but you, you can redirect from something else. Oh, okay. So um, in other words, what appears to your program as standard in can be the actual socket that your operating system has opened and fed to your program as if it is just a regular file. Okay. Um, so we don't have to worry about the errors. You know, at this point, you know, my test program is really simple. You know, your, you know, most programs do not need to deal with this for the time being. Notes. Uh, on NFS file systems, we're not dealing with NFS in this case. NFS stands for Network File System, uh, which was the de facto standard of any type of network file system in Linux. But I think it's not uh, used that much anymore. I think Samba is now the quote unquote the de facto standard for sharing files over a network. Um, see also, okay, you know, so there are other topics that you might want to read when you, you know, want to you know, know how to use read and write. Um, but for the most part, we don't have to deal with this, at least for the time being. Okay. Any questions about the man page? I have a question. How do we get out of man? Q. Q. If you don't know how to get, get out of man, type the uh, question, no, not question mark, type H for help. Then you have man on man, you know, tells you how to use man. Yep. I have a question. Yep. Uh, Say like we want to print it, but we don't have a printer. We want to print a man page, but we don't have a printer hooked up, so we can't use the terminal print. Then we save that information to a file. Like if we want to print it off a Windows system. Oh. Well, now I feel stupid. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Does everybody understand what I'm what I just did? Redirect. Man to read redirect <coughs> to read dot man as a file. Now, it is smart enough, you know, man is actually pretty smart. It knows that if you're not using your terminal to open it, 
it, it understands that you know the escape code for like boldface and underline and stuff like that will not be generated automatically. So when you look at man, uh, read.man, I think it is just a, a plain ASCII file. It's just a plain ASCII file. You can see the underlines are no longer there. Okay. So that's one quick and easy way to do it. Any other questions about you know uh, reading the man pages or how to access manual pages for various functions that we would be using in this class? No questions? Okay. If there are no questions, we'll go ahead and continue with the homework assignment. The only information that is missing from the man page is FD is the file descriptor. Internal to the process, each open file is represented by a file descriptor. We talked about that in a previous class already. You don't have to open any files in this program because standard in is already open as file descriptor 0 and standard out is already open as file descriptor 1. So that means you know the FD um, argument to read and write can be just an integer, 0 or 1. And you guys have to decide which one goes to which function. You can also redirect the input or output of a process in the shell command and these file descriptors will be associated with those files automatically. So you can use the greater than symbol to redirect the output. You can use the less than symbol to redirect the input. Your task is to create a subfolder called sddinout in your cisp 453s directory, which in return is in your home folder. Yep. So you do, do you need to do that to redirect it, or does it automatically do it? You have to do it manually. So you have to use mkdir to do it. Or if you don't want to learn how to use MKDIR, WinSCP can do it for you too. So oh, to, oh, no, I'm talking <coughs> about um, what you said last about if you redirect the input or the output. Oh, the that's redirection? If that's if you have a file that you want to. Right, you have to create the file. And then on the command line, you have to say um, std uh, in out less than, and then the that's file it will redirect from the input. And if you also specify greater than, it can redirect the output to a file as well. Otherwise, if you just start up your program, it's automatically going to, you know. Use the console, yeah. It's going to automatically use the keyboard as standard in, and then use the screen as standard out. Yep. If you uh, redirect the file in, mm -hmm. will it automatically append uh, the end of file character, or are you going to have to find no. put the, the end of line ca the end of file character does not get stored in the file itself. Right. So therefore, it should not be in the input file, and it should not appear in the output file either. But it would be appended automatically by the, if you pipe in a file? If you pipe in a file, the end of file condition will be automatically set at the right time. Okay. In other words, you know, when you do a redirect in, there's no such thing as a control D. Control D is a quote unquote cooked feature of the command line so that when you're only, it only works when you're interactive. When you're not interactive, there's no such thing as control D to end the file. Okay. Any other questions? Good questions? All right, so keep reading here. The source file must be named stdinout.c, otherwise my greater script won't work because it's looking for this particular name and no points will be rewarded. Your, your program should perform a simple task. Echo everything from standard in to standard out. Whatever you type on the keyboard, it has to echo out on the screen. Exit when, when end of file of standard in is encountered. Okay. Um, well, from the man page description, we have already talked about how to detect end of file. Okay. So it's, it's all there. It's, 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 it's a part of one sentence that talks about you know, how to detect end of file. You may assume there are no errors to handle, so that, that's why you don't have to deal with Burnham. Um, read the man page of read to find out how to detect end of file of an input file. I suggest that you use a loop and read standard in byte by byte. It's only a suggestion. If you want to go, you know, make it more difficult for yourself, hey, go ahead. You know, mm -hmm. I, I won't stop you. <clears throat> if anyone wants to use recursion instead of a loop, hey, go ahead. You know, <laughs> I get. I promise you, I won't get. I won't use a very long, big file to exhaust the stack. <coughs> your stack for exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not only exhausting; it's stacking. 
For your own testing, you can, you can name the executable file anything you want because I'm going to recompile your code anyway. And here is an executable that you can use for comparison purposes. Note that you need to change the permission of the file to let it execute. WinSCP can do this. Check the X flag for user or execute shmod uh, u plus x in out in the CLI command line interface. So here's how I would do it. Right click, and then you say save link as. And put it into a folder. I'm gonna put it into today's little folder, you know, stuff that I'm capturing for today. That would be in user. Oh, you know what, I forgot to do one thing. know what I just forgot uh, what I forgot to do I forgot to make sure there's enough room on my uh, persistent drive to store today's uh, files so I'm gonna have to do rm 2012 01 star it happened to me once you know I did not re I did not I forgot to delete you know the flash files that have been uploaded already and um, so the recorder just you know failed silently until I started to until I wanted to create a file, and then the file system says the you know, disk is full. So in that class, I only got like one quarter of the class recorded. So it's a good thing that I caught this one. Make sure that uh, it's still recording, so we did not run out of space. Very good. What was I about? What what was I about to do? Oh, Shimon. Okay. Uh, did I save the file already? yet so I can go to today's folder click save and you'll keep the file name in out and now the file is saved now now that I have a file saved you know when I use LS it shows up not a problem okay the file is here already if I use LS dash L it shows me that uh, we have a file here but there's no executable here in other words this should be an X and you know well okay I'll just put it this way this should be an X so that as a user owner of the file, I will be able to execute the program. So the way to make it executable is to run the command. chmod u plus x in out. Okay, chmod u plus x in out. And I, if I do an ls again, whoops, ls dash l. You can see that this time I have an executa executable flag already turned on, which means at this point, as a user owner of in out, I should be able to run the program. The, yep, go ahead. Um, I know for for script files, you need to execute them. You need read and execute uh, privileges. But is that true for executable files? Yes. Okay. Yep. Anything that you want to execute that is executable, be it a binary or a script or anything else, you have to have the execu executable flag turned on. And the read. Mm, no. Interestingly, not the read, you have to have the execute turn on. Yep. Okay, so I'm running the program. It looks like this. It doesn't seem to do anything until I type you know, a single letter. And it doesn't do the echoing right away because the lines are cooked. In other words, I can type stuff on a line, use the backspace, do some more stuff, editing. And then when, as soon as I press the enter key, this entire line will be fed to the program. So it echoes line by line and not character by character or key by key. So that's why the backspace key is never echoed because you know it is you know, it's in a cooked mode. Yep. Just out of curiosity, if someone were to write this program using an array, what's the max amount of characters you can input in the terminal? I do not know. <laughs> I'm assuming it's going to be a power of two. And it's not going to be 256, it's going to be a little more than that. I'm suspecting it's 64 kilobytes, but that's just my <laughs> suspicion. You can test it. Okay. <laughs> I just fell asleep, <clears throat> press Z. Okay, so this program is working. Um, if I press Control D, which, end, which indicates end of file, let the program exits. Okay, no problem here. Are there any questions about the test program? How to get the test program to work and what it is actually doing? It's not doing anything important. Okay. When you're done, you execute this 
uh, portion here. The important part is this is a back tick, which is uh, the key at the upper left corner of your keyboard, right below the escape key. Uh, it's not the single quote, it's the back tick. Back tick is a very important thing. Let me just show you what back tick does. Okay, if I say echo, it will just, you know, it will just you know, report that thing. If I say echo single quote PWD, it would just be PWD because single quote is just used to enclose you know, a string that you want to print out. Now, if I say echo backtick PWD, it prints that out. What? So what backtick does is it will run the command and it will take the output of that command and that becomes the value of the backtick expression. How did you get your executable so small? <laughs> I think I might have stripped the uh, symbol table out, or I might have turned on dash O2 or something like that. Turn on the optimizer, basically. Stripping it doesn't get it that small. It does not? No. <laughs> Try dash O2, you know, dash uppercase O2. Okay. Um, the optimizer may actually do a fairly good job getting rid of your know, code that does not need to be there. You're sure you didn't write it in assembly? <laughs> um, I could have, but I don't think that's the case here. <laughs> All right. So are there any questions? No questions? So the grading of this assignment is all or none. It's a very low point value homework assignment. Once again, this homework assignment is not really testing whether you understand the concept that we talk about in the class. It's more making sure that you have the right environment to write the programs, to get your feet wet, basically. Okay. Any questions? Hmm. Yep. So does it, um, when you're, I don't know, is it, does the program wait at any, at any point? I mean, it seems like you, like... My task script is just going to pipe or redirect, you know, a file in. It will capture the file out and will compare those two files and make, make sure that they are the same. And I'll test, you know, simple test cases, um, like, you know, one single line, multiple lines, and an empty file. So I will test those three for sure. I think what I'm trying to ask is it seems like I don't see, I don't see how, I don't know, I don't know really what I'm asking. Just as far as like if you're going through in a loop mm -hmm. and you're going byte by byte, it seems like I don't see, I don't know, it just, I don't see where it would wait to wait for the next. The waiting for the next one is, the, is, a, is a property of your teletype terminal, the TTY terminal is in a cooked mode, yeah. and that's why you know the it will only feed the program on a line by line basis. But when you redirect a file from a, you know, when you redirect a standard in from a file, it won't wait at all. It will just give the give your program everything, and then your program will just go zzz, process the whole thing, and then it'll um, echo everything out and be done with it. Okay. Any other? Yep. Um, you know, if the instruction says you know, TGZ, just you know, make it a TGZ extension so that my script can look for that. <laughs> Any other questions? No other questions? You guys know how to get started with the homework assignment? Okay, very good. Now, even so, though this... Uh, do we lose points if we don't put in the negative one check? You won't lose any points because I specifically said that you don't have to handle any error conditions. Okay. All right, so now that we have a, the first real programming assignment, you know, you might want to know, you know, how do I debug a program in this environment? So let's go ahead and write some faulty programs in so that we can actually go through the exercise of debugging a program. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll just say bad one dot C, you know, obviously there'll be additional bad programs that I'm gonna write. Um, Okay, this is my first bad program. It's a bad program, why? It doesn't return a value. I mean, if you look at the definition of main, it is supposed to return an integer, but it has nothing here. It does not even return an integer, okay? Now, for this program, obviously, it's not gonna be a problem because you know, main is the starting point of your program, 
So whether it really returns a value or not, hey, you know, it's not a big deal whether it's returning a value or not. But with other functions or with other functions or subroutines that you'll be writing, if you have a return type, which implies that the function should be returning a value, but for some reason you forgot, you forget to return a value at the end of the function, um, you probably want the compiler to complain about it because otherwise the caller of the function will still assume that a meaningful return value is returned and it will interpret that value for whatever you know, the, the caller is uh, trying to do. But your program or your subroutine is actually not returning anything or returning, it's not specifying a return value. It will still return a value, you just don't know what it is returning. So your program will work you know, sometimes and probably not work other times as a result. So the first thing we want to do is to say, can we turn the compiler into a very nagging mode and you know, so that it will complain about every little thing? If you just say GCC, dash C means we just want to create the object file because you know, I don't even want to you know, create the executable in this case. Um, GCC says everything is fine. But that's because you know, by default, you know, the warn all option is not turned on. So what you want to do is to specify warn all, dash uppercase W, lowercase A-L-L. And now it does a fairly good job of saying, hey, something is not right here. It's only a warning, which means you know, the, the program is still compiled and object file is created. It's just that, well, maybe you should fix this before you try to run the program. So in this case, it says control reaches end of non-void function, which is basically saying, you know, well, you're supposed to return something, but I don't see the return statement anywhere in the subroutine. Is that okay? All right, so let's go ahead and fix that problem. Easy enough. <coughs> Just give it a return zero, and then after <coughs> that, and then I'll also you know just make a dummy um, variable here. That's a pretty dumb program because you know in C, when you say return, it actually gets out of the subroutine. So any any code that you specify after a return is pointless. But we are not going to write any programs like that. But I know some of you will sprinkle returns inside a subroutine. Now when you do that, you can run into this problem, but it is really difficult to see, to see that you have a problem like this. Okay, so we want to see whether the compiler can catch this one too. It shouldn't be an error. Well, it's not an error, but it is a warning. Variable but X is set, but not used, but that's not what it is, should be reporting, because it should be reporting a dead branch. Yep. What happened? I mean, wh <coughs> why is it in there? What if you use an if statement to determine when you wanted to return? Ah, very good. Okay, I can see what you're saying here. That shouldn't be an error. Okay. Uh, some people would say, well, what if I have a conditional statement here, and you know there are two branches, and you know there's a whole bunch of code here, and some point it's going to say return zero, and then the other one I forget to yeah. specify any return. That can happen too. I personally would never sprinkle returns inside a subroutine. That's just that's just my you know my, my programming uh, principle. You know, but I'm not going to grade your homework assignment based on that. You know, that's definitely just you know personal stuff. You know, whether you want to do it or not, it's entirely up to you. Okay, but there there should be another warning here because x equals zero should create a warning, and yet the compiler does not know about it. The problem with this is the compiler at this point, even with warn all, is not analyzing the execution paths to the point where it understands, hey, this will, we will never get to that line. To get to that particular warning message, you actually have to specify dash uppercase O2. I think O1 may do it too, but O2 will definitely do it. Oh, no, it doesn't do it either. Mm. What are the numbers that are getting generated, the 3-7 and 3-1? Yes, these are line numbers. Um, it is a line number. In this case, it's telling you where x was declared and where it was used. So line 3 is where it was declared, and line 7 is where it was quote unquote used. Were there seven lines in that right now? Well, let's take a look at the file. Line 3 is where it was declared, and then line 7 is the end of the function. So it tells you, you know, this function, 
is the, is the one that is problematic. All right. All right. So these are pretty, you know, simple stuff. You know, mostly syntactic, and you know, it doesn't really affect the correctness of your program. Let's go ahead and do something that will actually introduce problems. Um, we'll say x equals zero to begin with. We'll make a loop while x is less than three. Do the following. Now, even though I know that I don't need to uh, use curly braces here, I'll go, I'll put it in. Yep. I think it's actually the column that x is declared at. So. Oh, the column. You mean this one? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Column. Yep, line three, column seven. Very good. Thank you. Which all, unfortunately also coincided with the end of the function. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so this one is written correctly, right? I mean, you know, x starts with a value of zero. Uh, while x is less than three, I stay in the loop. Each iteration will add one to x. So eventually x should become, you know, at least three, and then the loop should exit. And I'll put back my return zero here. So this program should conclude without any problems. What if I accidentally made a mistake and use a subtraction instead? It's going It'll indefinitely. Work. Well, the program will still go, will still get out of the loop, unfortunately. Does everybody understand why, in this case, the program will still exit? No. Or the loop will still get out? Size of the, it'll go it will, back. Around. It wraps around, okay? It will take a while because it will have to go through uh, about four billion um, iterations, four billion minus three iterations, but it will still get out. But then, how do we find a problem like this? You know, because you know the program is not exiting like right away; it's taking a long time to exit. So let's go ahead and take a look at this program. And this time, I will create the executable called bad one. Um, I will also specify dash g so that later on, if I want to use GDB, I can have the symbol table for debugging. And that one dot C is the source of the file. Okay, do a ls, ls dash l. I confirm that we have a program called bad one, and it has all the executable flags turned on. So from that perspective, everything is good to go. I type dot slash bad one, hoping that nothing is wrong with the program. Okay, and hey, it's, it's, it should become it should be it should be coming back like right away. How come it's taking so long? Okay, something is not right. Something does not seem right in this case. So what I will do is I will use the debugger to help me find out what is wrong with this program. GDB is the name of the debugger, and you know you just have to say GDB and then the name of the executable. And now we're in GDB. We know we're in GDB because the prompt is now GDB in parentheses. It's no longer what it used to be, which is your username at you know the machine name and then the path to the current working directory. All right. Any questions at this point? When you did the GDB, why didn't you have to do the dot slash bad one? Because in this case, uh, I am not executing the program directly. I'm telling GDB that I want this executable file to be the one that I want to debug. So if, I, if I'm not executing it directly, th there's no need to specify a dot slash. Okay. Okay, in GDB, there are a few commands that are really useful. The first one is L, which stands for list. And that's all it does. It lists your program, I think, 10 or 20 lines at a time. If you press the enter key again, it will list the next 10 or 20 lines. You can also specify, I just want to list you know, the program from line 5 and up. You know. But in this case, since line 5 is right in the middle of the program, it actually lists the whole thing too. Um, so that's, you know, that's a useful function. Okay, you, know, you, you have to first be able to look at the program. The other way is for you to open up the editor on the side. You know, some programmers like to do that. So, so instead of using list inside the debugger to look at the source code, you can keep your VI or whatever editor you want to use open. Um, some editors like VI can display line numbers on the side. That makes it very easy to determine which line do I want to stop in order to look at something. Yep. Did you say that? Um uh, with the with the putting L and five that lists around line five. It will center around center line around. five. Yeah, it will center around line five, and it will display you know the content of the program. But this is a simple program, so when it centers around line five, it actually li displays you know, the entire program too. Yep. How do you get VI to display line numbers? To get VI to display line numbers, you do it like this. So. Uh, 
um, you say game to bi first. Uh, you just say nu. I think it's set nu for num line number. Thank you. And then it displays the line number on the side. Cool. And if you want to turn it off, I think it's just no nu, and that turns off line number. Sweet. All right. Any questions up to this point? No. No questions. Now I know the program is not working correctly, and I have a kind of suspicion that something is wrong with the loop because other than loop, there's nothing here in this program. So what I want to do is to stop it on line five. You know, at the when it evaluates the condition, I want it to stop. You know, just so that I can see how the value of x is changing. Um, I can also optionally make it stop on line seven when I'm supposed to you know change the value of x. So to put a set to set a breakpoint. You know, you use the B command, which stands for B R E A K break. It's an abbreviation. If you want to spell out break, it's fine too. Okay, B R E A K. You know, it means the same thing as B. And then one way to use break is to supply just the line number. In this case, we are supplying the line number of five. B five will put a breakpoint on line five. Um, I can also put another breakpoint on line seven if I want to. There we go. Now we have two breakpoints in the program. I will go ahead and run the program. R runs the program at full speed until it encounters a breakpoint. Then it will stop. Okay. So now the program has stopped on line five because I set a breakpoint on line five. First thing I want to do is to say what exactly is the value of x because I want to make sure that x starts with the correct value. Well, sure enough, it starts with the value of zero, which is correct. And if you want your program to continue execution at full speed, the command is called C for continue. Okay? But it's not going to go very far because I have another breakpoint on line 7. When you see that we are on line 7 right now, it means it is about to execute line 7. It has not executed the code on line 7 yet. Now because the debugger is on a line by line basis, if you have multiple statements on the same line, there's no way to stop between the statements. Okay, you can only stop at the beginning of that line, but when you say continue or when you say step, it would actually try to execute all the statements on that line. So it doesn't support step into? Um, if you have a subroutine call, it will step into, but if you have multiple assignment statements, there's nothing to step into because they're not subroutines. Okay. Okay. Well, the easy fix is easy. You know, just put one statement on one line. So that makes it easy to you know, differentiate you know, what it is doing step by step. All right, so at this point, I'll just be you know, careful and print the value of x again. It is 0, but that is correct, because I have not executed line 7 yet. I have not decremented or changed the value of x yet. Okay. So instead of making um, the program run at full speed again, I'm just saying, OK, let me just see the result of, run of line 7. So in that case, I use S for a single step, which in which case, you know, in, in this case, you know, it's, it's stopping on line 5 again because there's nothing after line 7. But if I had a, 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 additional code after line 7, single step means I would just execute line 7 and then I would stop again automatically. Is that OK so far? Does everybody understand what I mean by that? OK. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the value of x. And I go like, oh, OK, x is moving in the opposite direction. Because I want it to go up 0, 1, 2, and then eventually 3 to get out of the loop. So now I know why the program is taking so long to exit, because it's waiting for the entire integer to wrap around you know, back into 3. So, so at this point, I can stop the program. Now, if you want to mess around with your program a little bit, you can actually change the value of the variables inside the debugger. Yep. Uh, what if you did uh, list or L right now? Would it would it list around the line that you're current execution have? point? I believe so. Well, in this case, it doesn't really help because you know it's a very small program. Okay. Now, getting back to what I just said, if you want to change the variable at this point. You can actually do it. So I'm just going to say, well, I'm just going to force x to be have a value of 4 at this point. Remember, I'm just about to execute the code on line 5. We haven't done it yet. So this time when I single step, it gets out of the loop. Because guess what? x now has a value of 4. 
and when you single step, you know, return zero, <coughs> it will just get all the way back. You know, this is completely normal. It, it, it's complaining that it, ca it cannot find the source file of libc-start.c. It's because, you know, we, you know, I did not include the source file for the library functions. But at this point, it's out of your main already, so your program has concluded uh, successfully. Are there any questions about you know using GDB for debugging? Yep. This is an important, but when you uh, when you ch when you printed your variables, it gave you like dollar sign one, and then the next time you printed it, it gave you dollar sign two. Is that just telling you how many times you printed it, or? No, it's actually um, a, a reference number to refer to historical clinical historical values. Um, so if for any reason at a later point of the debug session that you want to refer to a value that you have printed earlier, now you can just say print dollar one plus dollar two, the whole thing multiplied by dollar three. In other words, you can refer to those results that you have printed from earlier, so you don't have to copy and paste, you know, on the command okay. line. Good question. Any other questions about using GDB? Is there a GUI version of it? Yes. <laughs> ask if there are um, essentially watch lists. I believe so. Okay. If you just type help, it will show you, um, you know, the main topics, aliases, breakpoints, data. So I'm suspecting a watch list would be under data. So either data or or running. Tracing of program execution without stopping the program could be trace points. I'll look under data first. Okay. Under data, we have display. Dump display. display. Is that what you're looking for? You know, every time you stop the execution, it displays the value. Sounds about right, and it rings a bell. I was using it a few years ago. Just have okay. Well, let's find out. You know, help. Display print value print value of expression exp each time the program stops. Okay, and as in the x command, it, da, 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 da. oh, it, with no arguments, display all currently requested auto display expressions. Use undisplay to cancel display request previously made. Well, let's give it a try. I say display x. No simple, well, that's because I, my program is out of that context already, so it doesn't understand what is X. So I have to run the program again from the beginning, and then this time I can say display X, so that I can, every time I type continue, it automatically display the value of X. Very good. Good suggestion. Yep. I, I know this doesn't apply too much when we're talking about systems programming, but can it detect deadlocks? I don't think GDB has the ability to detect deadlocks. Yep. What did you What did you just do? You did display X. It, it automatically does it every time. Yes. It basically what it puts X or the val or the expression X in this case because you know it doesn't have to be a simple expression like that. It can be X plus Y. The whole thing divided divided by two to the power of something. But anyway, it, it just takes that expression. And um, every time I stop the program for any reason, it can be a breakpoint, it can be me um, pressing the control C, you know, uh, pressing control C. But every time it stops, it will display the, um, con the, the value of that expression. It's just a handy feature uh, so that you don't have to say print X every single time. But X has to be in scope in order for this to work. If it is out of scope, does it display an error or does it just not display X? I've never tried display Y. Yeah, it would just, okay, the question is what happens when I do this? Yeah, it doesn't even take it. It won't even put it into the watch list, I think. All right, so are there any questions? I think these commands in GDB are sufficient to debug the program that we have at hand right now. Any other questions? No other questions? Okay. If there are no other questions, we'll get out of GDB, which is just a queue.
or if you press Control D, you know that will get you out of GDB as well because Control D is end of file. So when you press Control D when you're in GDB, you're telling GDB I'm all done, and it will get you out of the uh, GDB environment. Alrighty. So that's your homework assignment. Are there any questions related to the homework assignment? You have one week to work on it. Uh, the due date is um, next Wednesday. No questions? All right. If there are no questions, we'll continue our discussion with uh, regarding the partition table. And oh, also I have a general forum here so that you guys can communicate through the forum. Um, you can post, you can reply, you can just read. Um, it's not required that you read or post. You know, it's not, this is on, on, not an online class. Um, it's just so that you know, if you have any questions and you think another student may have the answer, you can post it. Or if you find something that's really cool, you, know, you want to share with the rest of the class, you can do it too. <coughs> There's only one restriction. Do not post any code that, is, that directly relates to any assignments. That's the only restriction, is you cannot post the answer of your homework assignments. <laughs> you can post code that doesn't relate to the assignments, then, right? Hmm? You can post code that doesn't relate to the assignments. Yeah. All right. So getting back to where we left off last time. Okay, this I haven't really talked about. Um, this we have talked about already. We are taking the master boot record from um, the hard drive SDA. And then this one we kind of talked about, you know, but we haven't really talked about object dump. We only talked about hex dump. The difference between hex dump and object dump is hex dump can only dump out the value as hexadecimal values, octal values, binary values, and so on but it does not disassemble the code, okay? Object dump, on the other hand, can disassemble the code. In other words, in this case, I'm disassembling the code um, for the I386 or the 8086 instruction set. So this way you can actually look into the bootstrap code and understand what it is actually trying to do. This part is optional, you know, we don't have to do this, you know, because it's, it, it's just cool to know, but not, you know, particularly important in this class. Any questions about this part? No questions? All right. Let's go ahead and go back to Wikipedia because last time we were in Wikipedia uh, when we tried to understand the um, master boot record. And we were talking about, we were just about to talk about a partition record. What is inside a partition record? What's inside a partition record are these bytes. There are 16 bytes to each partition record. And these are offsets to those particular locations. From offset zero, which means we are talking about the first byte of those 16 bytes, is the status. The status is actually a waste of bits because you know, it, it can either be 80, which means the partition is bootable, or 0 if the partition is not bootable. Anything else is invalid. Okay, so to me, that's a waste of a bit space. Um, the first byte is the CHS address of the first absolute sector in the partition. Uh, C stands for cylinder, H stands for head, and then S stands for sector. You can see the pop up box here. And the length of this is three bytes, okay? So this is a three byte um, quantity. And the first one is the, um, the first one is actually the sector. The second one is the head. And the last one is the, oh, I take it back, Never mind. Okay, the first one is the head. The second one is actually a combination of um, the sector size or the sector number and also a part of the cylinder number. Do you guys know how to read something like this? H7-0? It means it is bit 0 to bit 7 of the head um, count of the CHS notation. 
So this means a sector, or this means the, the specification of which head of the drive you want to specify can only go from 0 to 255 in base 10. Is that okay so far? Because there are exactly 8 bits when you go count from 0 to 7. Yep. So um, in this far, in this left column, the offset, mm -hmm. what, what is that What's going on there? Is it it's the number of bytes from the beginning of a partition record to get to this particular field. Okay. What about this one here? This is telling me which sector we are trying to address on each track. How, what is the number of possible sectors on each track? Well, first of all, how many bits have we allocated to specify the number of sectors? Six. Six bits. Sorry, does that mean that this is a little Indian? Sorry? Does that mean this is a little Indian? This is little Indian? Yeah. Um, no, it does not matter. It, there's not, okay, at this point, we don't have any relevancy to Indianness. It is little endian. Well, no, it is not little endian because you can see that the lower byte has the higher, the more significant bits. Oh, okay. So it's not little endian. But in this case, you know, they spell out what each byte is. So therefore, the discussion of endianness does not really matter because you know that only place you know, has a place when you have a multi-byte thing, and then you have to determine you know which byte goes first. Is it the least significant byte or the most significant byte? In this case, it's actually a part of the more significant byte going first and then the least significant bits goes next. Okay. okay, getting back to the discussion of the sector. In this case, a sector can only go from 0 to 63 because you know 2 to the power of 5 is, um, excuse me, I take it back. 31. 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 6 minus 1, which is the largest number you can represent using 6 bits, is 63. Okay. Now what is more mysterious is this part here. What, what do we mean, what, what does it mean when it, say, when it says C9-8? That means these two bits, right here, the most significant two bits of this particular byte, represents bit 8 and bit 9 of the cylinder number. It's only a part of a 10-bit integer. The last, the most significant two bits of a 10-bit integer is stored here, and then the least significant eight bits are stored in the next byte you know, from offset number three. Okay, any questions? Yep. So how could there be, how could there be 10 <coughs> bits if that's just a byte? Because two bits is somewhere else. There are eight bits here, and then two more bits here. In other words, the 10-bit number is split into two bytes. Okay. Good question. Thank you. So that's <laughs> yeah. Oh, so those two. Okay, so you got six and seven there. As part of that. Okay, got it. Okay. So what we'll do now is we are going to take a look at a program that will only parse this part. Okay. So we'll write a very simple program to look into a partition table and just report back where is the starting point of that partition in terms of CHS, cylinder, head, and sector, okay? And we'll keep this page up because you know it has all the relevant information that we need. We'll go back to one of the command prompts here. Uh, not this one, maybe this one, okay. I'll go ahead and copy the master boot record that I have recorded from the previous class. So that will be 2010101130. MBR.bin. Copy that to here. So now I have my own master boot record here. The first thing you might want to do is to try to do it by hand. In other words, don't write a program to do it until you know how to do it by hand first. So we'll, we'll go ahead and see how we can do it by hand. If you do it by hand, whether you do it by hand or whether you do it using your program, you still have to know where is the first partition record in the boot rec in the master boot record. All right. Getting back to here, you can see that the table of primary partitions start with you know, byte 446, or in hexadecimal, 
it is byte 1 B E. Okay. So we'll go back to the command prompt and then we'll just do a hex dump. Well, I can never remember the, all the options of hex dump, so I always have to use man page to remind myself. Uh, let's see, which one would be a good one to do it? Doesn't have any binary, but hexadecimal is just as close. So we'll go ahead and pick a hexadecimal display, which is dash uppercase C. I guess I can use a format string, and the format string may have a binary option. I don't know. Doesn't seem that way. All right. We'll just do uppercase C. Hex dump, hex dump dash uppercase C, mbr.bin. Well, if you do it like uh, without you know, piping it through less, it will just display something like this, which is really hard to read because you you can go page you can go page up and page down by pressing the shift key first and then page up and page down. But it is actually a whole lot easier if you pipe it to less so that it will only display it you know page by page, and you can also scroll in this case. You can scroll line by line too. All right. So what we are seeing here is the content of a 512 byte master boot record. On the left hand side, you have a column that tells you that this row starts from byte location zero. This row starts from, loca starts from uh, location of offset one zero in hexadecimal. This is, these are not decimal numbers, these are hexadecimal numbers. And the third row starts with two zero in hexadecimal. I never say this is 20, okay? Because when I say it's 20, it implies it's the decimal number 20. I only say this is two zero in hexadecimal, which is actually 32 <coughs> in decimal, okay? So do, do we know how to locate, you know, the row that contains the information that we want? Sort of, okay? The rest of this, each one is one byte. This is byte two zero. This is byte two one, byte two two, and all the way to the end here, this is byte two F. Because F is the last digit in the hexadecimal number system. Are we doing okay so far with you know reading the hex dump of you know any anything? Okay. Alright, now that we know how to read hex dump, we want to start with location one <coughs> EE. The decimal value is useful you know, if, when you are doing the programming, but since we are looking at a hex dump, everything is, is in hexadecimal, <coughs> one BE is what we want to look for. So let's go to one BE, one BE. So this is one B, one BE is here. That's the first byte of the first partition record of this particular hard drive. Yep. Uh, the the left hand column, is that a function of hex dump or is that actually in the MBR? Like is the hex left dump column that is, there? that's a function <coughs> of hex dump. So that's not, okay, that's why it's all nice and neatly uh, arranged. Right. Got it. Okay. Yep. So the left column is the offset from byte zero of whatever you want to dump, and then the right hand side is just the content. Okay. In this case, I specifically ask it to display the bytes as hexadecimal values and also the ASCII code equivalence if there's an equivalent in ASCII. Okay, so okay, so so MBR really is just what's expressed in the, the middle, not not the left column and not the ASCII on the right. This entire portion here is the content of the MBR. Thank you. And each byte is expressed as a two digit hexadecimal <coughs> number. Got it. All right. So we are looking at byte zero of the first partition record in the system. What is this telling you? Well, let's go ahead and read back the, the, the interpretation of a partition record. We are looking at this item right oh, now. <coughs> it is 8-0, so it's telling you that this partition is, is bootable. That's right. So if I want to mess around with this system, I can change this to a 0-0, and then the next professor who comes in here will be kind of scratching his or her head and go like, the system is broken. <laughs> Oh, I think this should change one bit. I think you should actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should not because it's the, it, this is getting recorded. Oh, is that why you said? It's, <laughs> is that why yes. you said it's a waste of bit space because zero is the same as invalid, basically? 
Is that why you said it's no, no. Zero means non-bootable. Right, but it's eight non zero bootable. means bootable. So all the other values means invalid. So that's a, that's a that's a waste of a lot of bits. I, I, you know, this could have been done with a single bit. Oh, <laughs> got it. It doesn't need a byte, is what you're saying? Exactly. Oh, okay. Is deep freeze hardware or software? What? Deep freeze. Deep freeze is entirely software, oh. and you know by you know, booting the system in Linux, I'm completely bypassing <laughs> deep freeze. <laughs> but we are only looking at a at, at, a, at a capture of the master boot record. So even if I were to change the you know, mbr.bin, you know it's just a copy of the mbr. It would not actually have done anything to the hard drive. <laughs> All right. Okay. The next three bytes are important. Okay, the next three bytes represent zero, 01, which is you know the um, the location, the starting location of this partition in terms of the head location, um, and then we are looking at the next two bytes, which are the um, sector size, the sector number, and also the cylinder number of this particular uh, partition. So what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and look at those numbers. It's two zero, two one and zero, 00. Those are the values of the of these three bytes. And what I'll do is I'm going to open up a just thinking you know, what would be the best tool to do this. I will use a spreadsheet to do it. So we'll go to office calc. Nope, don't recover anything. Cancel. All right. So we'll go, oops, move too much. We'll go ahead and capture these three bytes. So we are talking about hexadecimal Z20, hexadecimal 21, and hexadecimal 00. Those are the three bytes that we want to look at. And at this point, I can just look at this and also look at this part here. All right. The first byte, which is 20, is really just you know the, the count of head as the starting point of that partition. Okay. So we'll go ahead and insert a row so that we can you know, just caption this. So this is the head, and it is bit 7 to bit 0 of head count. Basically the same notation, except I used a dot dot instead of a dash. The second byte is this one here. It is C98 and S50. Okay, C Nine eight and S five dot dot zero, and then the last one is C seven dot dot zero. All right. It might be helpful to convert everything to bits first, so that we can see the actual bit pattern. There's no such thing as a zero B prefix in C programming, so don't try this in you know, in the C program. But I'm using this to mean that you know, these numbers are binary numbers. Okay. What is the binary representation of two zero in hexadecimal? Zero, zero, zero. zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. And then this one is going to be pretty easy too. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero. Whoops. <laughs> typo, typo. I like it the other way. Okay. So now we have a better way to interpret this because what this means is the head or the beginning of that sector starts with head um, number, uh, that's 32. Okay. So we'll go ahead and write down here. Um, the cylinder, what is the cylinder number? The head number is cylinder, cylinder. 33. Ah. <laughs> cylinder, ah, okay. okay. The cylinder number is what? 33. The cylinder number is actually zero. 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 It's actually oh, zero. Right, because, yeah. because these two bits here, it's the most significant two bits, and then you have to combine it with Got these it. eight zeros. So it's basically all zeros. Right. Okay, so the cylinder number is zero. And the sector is one. Exactly. Got the it. sector number is not one because we have. Okay, something is a bit here. No, it's not, it's not one. You have a one here, you also have another one here. 
Oh, because that's still okay. Yeah. Yeah, because right. there are six bits. Got it. To six specify the sector five. number, so we are talking about sixty, uh, thirty-two plus one, which is thirty-three. Yep. I was assuming that they would uh, put the bits not eight and nine of the cylinder uh, on the highest order bits, so that basically they could and those out and then not have to do any other modifications to kind of get the the uh, proper interpretation of those bits is that right because it seems unless unless that's why they're doing it it seems odd to to break that up and have that at least if you represent it visually like this two bits on the left and then a gap and then the other eight so would that be why they would do that i have no idea why they do that you mean uh, okay <laughs> They they could have chosen any way to you know break up the bits you know you know as long as you have the documentation you can still get back to the original thing I mean it's it's really there's no easy and convenient way to do this I mean I mean the I would have chosen to put you know bit nine eight as the least significant bits here so I can read the whole thing as a sixteen bit integer and then just you know uh, use an and operation to mask uh, the other six bits to zero. But then when you tried to read the cylinder, you would have to do some operation to properly interpret those bits. Yeah, but that's just a shift operation, <laughs> which is one single instruction in assembly. So okay. it, it really doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Okay? Um, but that's a good point. The question is, do you think my interpretation is correct? <laughs> How do we know that my interpretation is correct? Well, let's go ahead and use a system tool to confirm that my observation is actually correct. First of all, I have to you know, SU as root, okay, because you know the following operation, which is F disk, can only be performed as root. Okay, so I will say F disk. Now don't do this, you know, at home, you know, it's just you know dangerous. You can do it to a virtual disk because you know back up the virtual disk first before you do something like this. Um, because F disk can pot potentially destroy the partition table. So in this case, I want to print the partition table, and it says, you know, SDA1, which is our first partition, starts at this number. But these numbers are, sil uh, are sector numbers. They're not using the CHS notation. If I remember correctly, there's a way to change this to display everything in a CHS notation. I just have to find out how to do that. Toggle DOS compatibility. No, 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 no. Okay. Extra functionality. I think it's D1WQ. Hmm? <laughs> 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 Print the partition table. Turn change number of sectors per track. Change number of Heads, fixed partition order. That's the way to do it. I just cannot remember it. Is there a command line option before you open it? What about printing the raw data in the partition table? Printing the raw data from the partition. That's exactly what we just did. Was that what you said? Mm hmm. Oh, right, manually, but I was hoping that it might give some uh, other information. Well, we have a few other, you know, CF disk. Ah, better. Okay, so you can do a unit print. There we go. Ah, excellent. So this is the interpretation using CF disk. So you were right. Um, the flag of the first partition is 80, which means it is bootable. The head count or the head number, the starting point of that particular partition starts with your know, head position 32, sector 33, and cylinder 0. That's exactly what we came up with with the spreadsheet. OK, so now that I understand that my interpretation of the bits is correct, now we can start to write a program to do it. Okay. Now CF disk is, um, I think the C stands for curses. So this is quote unquote the full screen version of F disk. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Which at one point of time it is considered like the, the holy grail of user friendliness. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> like this is like super duper user friendly. You know, if you ask for anything else, you'll be you're absurd. <laughs> All right, very good. Are there any questions at this point? No questions. It's all being recorded, so if you guys want to replicate the process, you can actually do so. You know, when you're work working from home, but make sure that you don't write anything back. Just use CF disk to examine a hard drive, and not to make any changes and write it back because you know that can potentially be very bad. All right. So now that we know the pro, I mean, uh, the way I interpret it is correct. Let's go ahead and write a program, or at least get started with a program. They can read back you know, that portion, and then we can try to use a program to interpret you know, those bytes and give me exactly the same information. Okay. In other words, we are trying to write a CF disk ourselves. Okay. So we'll go ahead and say read MBR, not C. I'll just give it a particular name here. All right. Um, I know for sure that I will need to use UNI STD, UNI STD dot H because I will need to use the read function call. I will also need to use, well, let's just use you know, the read function and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some other ways later on. And here's my main function, turning to zero. All right. The first thing we have to do is to open up MBR, which is something that we did last time already. So we have you know, FD as my file descriptor. So FD equals open MBR.bin is the file name. And we want to open it for read only. So it's RD only. So, um, but RD only is defined you know, somewhere other than um, S the UNI STD. So I have to find out where it's defined, and dash k. Dash k means I'm looking for any mentioning of this word. So give me all the topics that has any mentioning of the following you know, word. So in this case, o, r, d, only. What did you use? Is it sys? Oh, that's a word. Hmm? Oh, I was just trying to think of the header file that you used to, to get uh, r, d, only last time. Yep. Oh, that's an open. So Open. I'm gonna guess you know one of these contains the definitions, so we'll take all. Little <laughs> uh -huh. click. Ah, wrong place. Undo. Oh, this is bi. There's no undo. There's undo. <laughs> it's just lowercase u. You know that's that's undo. I forgot that I was in bi. All right. Sweet. <laughs> you guys can replay the sequence and uh, actually see what I did. Okay. Uh, what I did was I asked VI to say, you know, from this line to you know, and up to three lines after this line, uh, substitute all leading spaces. To um, actually, it, it substituted a little too much, mm -hmm. didn't it? Because it took out all the white spaces. You know, I actually need a little bit here. All right. So I will do a check here. If FD is less than zero, it is a problem. Else we can proceed. Okay. Uh, print F is in the standard. I O. Not gonna use the uh, write call. <laughs> what? Not gonna use the, the, the system call for write. Oh. <laughs> Just make you could. Do it recursively too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cannot open the file. Okay, I know this is not really exactly you know, informative, but I just want to make sure that I have one path. I check whether the file could actually open or not. Okay, now what do I do? Now that I have opened the file, the first thing I would do is to make sure that I remember to close it at the end. And then what goes in between here, you have several options. Once you open the file, you can use seek 
to go to the right location to only read that portion. But I can also do it in a slightly different way. I can, I can use a local buffer of 512 bytes, read all 512 bytes in, and then I have now one huge you know, character array to do things. So we'll go ahead and use the second approach in this case. So we'll say you know, char buffer 512. This is all bad programming practice because I'm using you know, 512 as a literal number instead of a macro. The, best, the better way to do this is to you know, do a pound define here. Pound define MBR size is 512. So everywhere I want to refer to the size of an MBR, I actually refer to the symbolic name. So this way, if the MBR is bigger or smaller, I only have one place to change. And then the next thing I want to do is to do a read. But instead of you know, trusting the system that it's always going to read you know, 512 bytes, I'm going to check that also. So we'll say um, bytes read. And then we'll say bytes read equals read. Um, we are reading from the file descriptor that we just opened earlier. We are going to read into the space allocated by the local variable buffer. And the number of bytes that I want to read is MBR size. Okay, so I'm, read, I'm trying to read all 512 bytes in, in one single shot and put it into the array that I have just declared. And then I will check if bytes read does not equal to, oh, wrong language, does not equal to MBR size. I think you know, this is an error condition too. So I'm going to report that problem. Else, I'm getting sick and tired of this space. So I'm going to do auto indent. Um, so I was just, I'll print, print the message here. Cannot read 512 bytes from the MBR file. It just has to be long enough to let me know what the problem is. And in the else case, I can actually do something about it. Because at this point, where the cursor is, not only have I opened the file, I have also successfully read 512 bytes into the buffer local variable, which is just an array. Are we doing OK so far? OK. So next, we'll go ahead and pound define um, partition table offset. And this time, I can use you know, uh, the decimal representation. I'm just trying to remember where it is. Four, four, six. Four, four, six. Okay. Four, four, six. Um, so this is the beginning of you know, those entries. If I'm only interested in the first partition record, you know, this is the, the beginning of the first partition record, because this is the beginning of the entire uh, partition record table. We are running out of time today, so I can't really, you know, finish this up, you know, any, you know, at this point. But on next Monday, I will give you some tricks, you know, to so that you can use a structure in C and actually, you know, do the interpretation using a struct um, instead of you using your, your byte offset interpretation. Okay, so I will see you guys on next um, Monday. Have a nice weekend. And don't forget to at least get started with the homework assignment. It's not very hard, you know, it's just take you time, some time to get used to the environment and get back into the programming, you know, mentality. I will save all of this stuff here. It is already saved in the video, but I will also upload it later on to uh, YouTube.